December 13th commission's meeting are approved and okay. accepted. Okay. Motion made by Commissioner McGonigal, seconded by Commissioner Baldwin. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So moved. Okay, next item. Financial statement with Kathy LeBron. H1. Would you like to take over, Commissioner? No. <laughs> I could never do it like you do. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Director, and members of the Commission. You should have two items that were in your packet from me, one being the financial statement dated December 31st, 2017, which brings us halfway through the fiscal year. Now you can go, Mr. McGonagall. <laughs> Jump right on to page no, I won't three. Jump onto it. No. <laughs> there are no changes to page one and two. And I will be brief because I realize this is a packed room to be in the draft wildlife rules, which is next on your informational agenda. And as you can see by looking at page three, where we have our breakdown of unrestricted revenues, we are still doing really, really well this fiscal year. I don't see any concerns whatsoever. And you may notice that on the third category down, miscellaneous sales and income for the month, we have a negative $20,000. I thought I'd be proactive in answering questions prior to you asking me a question on that. We received proceeds from an insurance company because one of our CO's vehicles was total. And I had to place those proceeds in an account and sit them there until I could move them into an appropriate place. So those proceeds were moved in the month of December from that miscellaneous revenue into an expense line so we can purchase another vehicle for our CEOs. So everything else is looking really pretty good. And if you turn to page four, where we have our projected revenues at the top compared to actuals, we are still significantly ahead of projected of our budgeted. And at the bottom of the page, where we do our comparison of year to year, we're about 114,000 above where we were last year. So do we have any questions on the financial statement? The other document that you received was your second quarter expense to budget commission report. Do you have any questions pertaining to that document? P 
Hearing none. I'm um, dismissed, I assume. Um, yeah, no questions. Thank you, Kathy. You're welcome. Okay. Next item. Presentation of draft wildlife rulemaking proposals with Matt Hillingwood. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Director, and members of the Commission. Um, for those commissioners I haven't had the pleasure of meeting, my name is Mark Ellingwood. I'm Chief of the Wildlife Division. And uh, today we are entering into uh, the early stages of our biennial season set. Um, I have provided each of you with a uh, schedule of our rulemaking process as a reminder to help you to understand exactly where we are and for the benefit of the audience. I remind you that today's uh, uh, presentations by our project leaders are draft initial rule proposals. These are the concepts that we have formulated the game management team prior to uh, uh, your input and or published review. Uh, so today's presentation is not a request for an endorsement, rather it's a uh, information item to help and inform and educate. The information we present today will be also promptly posted on our website for anybody in the audience or on the commission who has a, a desire to access it. I expect it will be uh, available tomorrow. Um, we have a, a number of presentations to give that go through the science of and the conclusions uh, that we have drawn regarding the different management units in the state and the different species that we manage. I want to mention to you after today we'll be presenting the same information to our regional and district staff for their input. Um, we will deliberate internally on a, a final uh, package of initial rules <coughs> will deliver to you in February at your February meeting. So on February 14th, we will come to you with our formal proposals asking for your vote and approval to proceed with formal rulemaking. Um, if and when you provide us with that approval, um, we will then initiate public hearing process and uh, we have scheduled those public hearing dates. Uh, both for Lancaster, Keene, and Concord. And again, this information will be posted for anybody who's interested. Uh, those, those public hearings will occur last day or so of March and the first two or so days of April. Following that and following public input through that process, uh, we have a, a responsibility then to uh, factor that input in, make final decisions, and on April 18th, come before you with a final rule proposal. Um, upon your uh, deliberation and action regarding that package, uh, the next step would be uh, in May, where Jail Carr would presumably review and approve those rules. So that's where we are today. Again, the information will be available. You see quite a few slides today. Uh, we cover a lot of ground. Um, we would welcome your input and feedback. These are drafts. Uh, we'll solicit that same input from uh, the rest of our staff and come back to you in February with a formal package for your approval. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm Dan Berger. I'm the Deer Project Leader for the department, um, and I'll be going through the um, proposals for 2018-19 um, deer season. Um, no real big changes to the general framework of the season. Um, regular firearm season will still be 26 days beginning the second Wednesday in November. Uh, muzzle loader season will be 11 days preceding that. Uh, the youth weekend is the weekend before the muzzle loader season opens. Archery season will still run September 15th to December 15th. Um, one change that we are proposing um, in uh, Wildlife Management Unit A, both the firearms and the archery seasons were shortened by a week um, back around 2006 and 2007. Those were in response, those shortenings were in response to concerns about buck age structure um, in that unit. 
um, and the targeting of mature bucks later in the year with snow on the ground and deer heading to, to deer wintering areas. Um, it does seem to have helped age structure. Um, however, there's been a lot of uh, requests that we restore um, some of that hunting opportunity. Uh, we are proposing that we could restore the firearm season back to the full 26 days. Um, looking at the data, um, there, there never really seemed to be any heavy targeting of adult deer or adult bucks during that last week of the firearm season. Um, and typically there's, there's really not enough snow on the ground during that time of year to have deer moving to deer yards. Um, so we believe we could restore that with having um, little to no impact on age structure. Uh, the archery season, however, we are still uh, proposing to keep that shortened by a week. Um, there did appear to be um, some heavy harvest pressure that last week of the season, um, and average snow depths are still quite a bit deeper that last week as opposed to the preceding week. Um, they're about twice as deep. The, the preceding week's about three to four inches. Um, that last week, there's still usually about eight to ten inches of snow on the ground on average up there. So, um, Some general background. Um, about how we set um, the deer seasons. So each wildlife management unit um, uh, has an estimated adult harvest sex ratio. Um, so essentially that's, that's the number of animals um, that you're looking at, that's the number of animals you're looking to harvest um, to either stabilize or increase or decrease the population. Um, we have estimates of what that should be for each unit. Um, and these are all in terms of adult does, um, so that's the way you impact change in the population, is by harvesting adult does. Um, so we have estimates of, of how many adult does essentially need to be harvested in each unit to either decrease, increase, or stabilize the population. Um, the way we achieve that harvest of adult does in New Hampshire is through either sex days. Um, so we have estimates of how many adult does should be harvested in each different unit giving very varying numbers of either sex days so we know if we offer this many either sex days during the firearm season in unit H2 for example uh, we'd harvest this many adult does and it would have this impact on the population so um, that's how we gauge what the harvest impact is going to be on the population and whether or not that should increase or decrease the population. Um, so what I'll do now is I'll bring you through each unit um, and, and give you the proposed changes to the either sex days. Um, there's a reference map in the corner that shows the wildlife management units. Um, <clears throat> this here is, the, is our population um, trend information. This is a two year running average of the adult buck kill. Um, this is used to track the change in the population over time. Uh, the red line here is our current population objective. Um, and these two lines, essentially, if we fall within this area, um, we consider ourselves at of the objective. Down here gives you the previous year's either sex day allocations, um, and over here there are the proposed changes. Uh, for unit A, we are right on the lower end of the objective. Um, we're not proposing any changes in either sex days. We had one during the muzzleloader season, one during the firearm season last year. Um, we should be able to maintain that and still allow for population growth. Um, one thing I'll say while I'm thinking about it, all these are contingent upon what happens this winter. Uh, if we have an overly severe winter that's going to increase mortality in different areas of the state, then um, these may change kind of last minute. We really won't know um, typically until about April or so. Um, so. So these could change based on winter severity. But right now, it's still too early to tell. So, um, so no proposed changes. We we maintain those uh, either sex hunting days in unit A. Uh, same is true for unit B. We're right here, kind of on the lower end of the objective, but allowing um, one day during the muzzleloader season, one day during the firearm season, should still allow for some population growth um, and allow for that uh, that population to stay there right around the objective. Um, I actually changed this around a little bit. I put C two. Next, as opposed to C1, um, these units share some similarities, and oftentimes they're um, they're discussed in conjunction with one another. So, um, last year actually we didn't have any um, either sex hunting opportunity, uh, or the last two years in these units. That would have been this is where we were for the last rulemaking. You see, the last two years we've jumped up a little bit. So, 
Uh, we should be able to allow one day during muzzle loader and the firearm season um, and still either grow that population or maintain it right there around the objective. Uh, C1, uh, we've been a little below the objective. We've dropped off the past few years, so um, we're not proposing to add any additional either sex hunting in that unit. Um, the same is true for unit D1. Again, we've been below for a little bit here, um, so we're waiting to see more growth out of that population before we offer some additional opportunity. D2 West, um, we've been above um, the, the, or at the high end or above. We, we've had a little bit of growth this past year as well, so um, in this unit, we're proposing to add an extra day to the muzzleloader season um, to, uh, to try and bring that population back down objective again. Um, D2 East, um, again, it's, it's seen a little bit of growth in the last couple of years, but it's still below that objective. We'd like to at least have a year or so in there uh, before, we, uh, uh, before we offer any, any additional either sex hunting opportunity. Um, unit E, um, that saw a little bit of growth. We're now near the high end of the objective there. Um, last year was the first year, and actually quite a while, we were able to offer any either sex hunting days. Um, the proposal this year is to move the either sex hunting from the muzzleloader season over to the firearm season. Um, that should give a little bit more opportunity to people. Typically, we have more firearms hunters, um, and, and typically we see higher adult doe harvest during the firearm season, so that should have a, have a bigger impact. Um, same for Unit F. We're actually above the objective in F now. Again, this is a unit that hasn't seen either sex hunting opportunity in quite some time. Um, and we're proposing to add one day to the, to the firearm season. Um, unit G1 um, continues to grow. Um, we've been increasing this uh, the last several years. Um, and again, with that continued growth, we're proposing to add an additional day to both the muzzleloader and the firearm season here to try and reduce that population. Um, G2. Um, is now um, at the objective and uh, in this unit again we're proposing to add one day of either sex hunting to the firearm season. H1, um, we are, we've been pretty stable right around the objective for the last several years. Um, so again we're looking to maintain what we've been doing with the three days during the mobile loader and the two days during the firearm season. Same is true for H2. Um, no changes there. We're looking to maintain that population at objective. Um, I1 um, has, uh, has, is at the objective now. Um, it's actually at the higher end of it. Again, another unit that has been quite some time since we've seen either sex hunting here. Um, so we're proposing to add a day to the firearm season here. Um, same for I2. That's at the lower end of the objective, but we still should be able to offer that um, and uh, keep that that population right around the objective there. J1 um, saw a pretty significant jump uh, the last couple of years. We're proposing to add a day to the muzzleloader and the firearm season in this unit. Um, that would give two days of muzzleloader and one day during the firearm season. Um, J2 um, is at the objective. Um, so again, we're not proposing any changes. We're just looking to maintain things where they've been. K, same is true for K. Um, that's been at the objective for, for a few years now. Um, so we're just looking to maintain things and, and not changing our either sex hunting there. Um, L uh, continues to grow. We did seem to stabilize the population when we first started uh, um, issuing additional antlers only permits here. However, we have seen some pretty mild winters. Those permits haven't really had a big impact because there's only about 20% of them were filled, and of that 20%, uh, very few of them are actually additional deer. Most people are using these in place of the tag they already have, not in addition to. So um, we're proposing, and again, we started pretty slow on these just because we weren't exactly sure what the impact would be, but um, after a few years' experience with these, we're proposing to take a, a decent sized jump and, and increase those permits from 750 to 2,000. Um, that should help. Um, that should help, help increase harvest there. Um, another thing that we're looking into, um, and uh, we'll have more information on this probably for the February commission meeting, but um, there, there was these permits 
Um, the last couple of years have been sold online, uh, first come, first serve basis. Uh, because there's so few permits and there's such a high demand for them, they sell out usually in a matter of minutes. Um, it creates a lot, of, uh, a lot of issues for us and people trying to buy them. So we are looking into issues. These will still be sold online only, only um, but we're looking into doing it an online lottery. Um, and we should have more information on that at the February meeting um, when we have a chance to talk to the vendor who actually runs that, that system for us. Um, unit M. Um, again, this this is similar um, to L, where, where you know we've had a we've somewhat stabilized it with the additional permits. One of the issues down here is um, we're kind of access hunting access is, is a big part of the issue. You know, some of these areas are starting to get pretty crowded. Um, we we've, we've tried not to uh, offer additional permits so that we don't have uh, more hunters going down there. So we've increased the number of tags that these permits have come come with. Um, what we're looking into now, and again, we'll have more information on, on some of the specific details, but uh, two of the things we're considering for this unit to increase harvest without increasing uh, uh, issues and conflicts with too many hunters down there is to allow crossbows um, in this unit during the archery season um, and the potential to allow people to kill two deer before they register the first. Uh, we're looking for some more input uh, from some of the different divisions for uh, that's uh, an official proposal, but uh, it's something that's being considered for, for this year. Um, that's what I just went over there. Um, statewide, this is uh, this is just kind of a sum of all the parts. So this is what we look like now. Um, you can see we are we're at the high end of our objective. This past season um, actually was the fifth highest total deer harvest we've seen um, going back to 1922, when we have good records on that. Um, it was actually the highest harvest we've ever seen um, for adult buck kill. Um, adult buck kill typically uh, is a better indicator of what the population is actually doing. So um, this was actually the highest adult buck kill the state has ever seen um, this year. Um, this is just a table that shows the changes um, from the previous years. Changes are highlighted in red. Um, but again, this will be posted online uh, for people to view. And uh, um, really, it's, it's increased hunting opportunity in, in uh, several of our units. We're not, we're not proposing to reduce anything anywhere because populations have been growing really well in most units. Um, another proposal that we have for deer is to create this system for deer management assistance program permits. Uh, most states in the Northeast now have a, simil uh, a system similar to this. Um, these would be permits that would be specific to towns. Um, um, so towns could make application for these permits. Um, the town would have to document um, that they have issues with overabundant deer. Um, so these are, these are intended specifically for towns that have uh, high deer densities and they're seeing issues that are related to those issues of overbrowsing and things like that. Um, <clears throat> this would be a way to focus hunting pressure in the problem areas as opposed to the unit as a whole. Um, you know, we don't want to reduce deer numbers in, in the whole unit if, if the uh, problem is contained in specific areas. Um, um, <clears throat> the town would have to identify what the area was that where the problem occurred. Uh, there would be minimum acreage requirements that they'd have to meet. Uh, the land would have to be open to hunting. Um, if it wasn't, we, we wouldn't have much um, impact in reducing the population. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and then the town would actually, we would, the town would make an application to us, we would submit the permits to the town, and then the town would be responsible for issuing the permits to the hunters. Um, we'd require the town to write a management plan, um, showing what their objectives were, uh, actions they'd taken, um, why our existing season framework has been unaffected for them in, in uh, either reducing deer densities or keeping them at lower levels. Um, we would, the department would uh, keep discretion on <coughs> or how many permits would be issued. Um, landowner permission would be required uh, from hunters. A uh, big problem with areas where you typically see high deer densities is access. Um, and, you know, we don't want issues with hunters going in areas where, where they're not wanted. Typically, these are urban areas with pretty heavy development. So, um, landowner permission would be required um, so that we didn't have any issues. And, um, you don't want uh, landowners getting aggravated and uh, further increasing posting of land. That would just make the problem worse. 
Um, each of these permits would come with two antlerless tags, um, and there would be a limit on the number of permits that hunters could get um, uh, of these permits. So it'd be one permit per hunter um, each year for whatever towns were. So if there was two towns, a hunter could get one permit for, for each town. Um, deer feeding, um, this was, uh, this here is, is actually a, a recent RSA that was passed. Um, the RSA um, actually um, kind of requires the department to make rules associated with this RSA. Essentially what the RSA says is um, if there's a situation where an individual is feeding a deer um, and it's detrimental to either public safety or the health of the animals, the department can give them a warning. Um, if they continue to do it, then they could be fined. It's somewhat similar to the bear feeding uh, rules that we already have. Um, this RSA um, said we shall adopt rules to define what things like uh, what um, a definition of food, the time of feeding, locations of feeding, what detrimental meant. So um, this here, and again, I'm sorry it's so small. Um, this is the text. Um, um, <clears throat> So essentially what it says is food for wild deer. Actually, I can't even read that. <laughs> so, uh, fortunately, I've got one I've got it here. For the memes over again, can you give us copies of that? Yeah, I can so make copies can of that. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so food for wild deer was, would be any ingestible substance knowingly placed the deer could feed upon. Um, feeding of wild deer would be defined as intentional aggregation by people of food, which results in attracting wild deer. Um, and then there was, a, there was a set of dates. It's between uh, the dates of December 16th and April 16th. Um, and part of that has to do with uh, what dates are for, for our definitions for baiting of, of things. So, um, feeding of wild deer should not be restricted unless the landowner is notified by a conservation officer that feeding activity is detrimental to the health of the deer population or a threat to public safety. Um, and uh, the way that we would document that would be one or more instance of vehicles colliding with deer in proximity to the feed sites, one or more instance of sick, dead, or dying deer resulting from consumption of food at such feed site, um, or confirmed predation of two or more deer in proximity to the feeding site. Um, and then it just goes on to say that once you're notified uh, by a conservation officer, you shall cease, and if you continue, you can be fined. Uh, and I can make copies of those and hand that out so you can see the text. And that's what we have for deer. Question? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Dan. I, I'm sure you're well aware uh, of the Hanover uh, deer team. Yep. Uh, is there a chance uh, that this year they might get additional uh, permits? So the, the DMAP program. Um, Did you want that? So yeah, so the DMAP program is what's intended to, to kind of resolve that issue. Yep. Um, so those would be, that would be a system that would allow us to give specific permits to, to the town and to the area where they're seeing those problems, okay. as opposed to just continually increasing hunting opportunity in the unit. Uh, that, would, that would focus the, the uh, hunting pressure in, in the areas that the town has, has been. So we, that, that rule, um, came about because of the issue in Hanover, but we thought it would be better um, to create a rule that we could use for other areas without having to go to rule every time something like this pops up. Um, likely, we're only going to see more of this as things uh, as time goes on with increases in development and, um, and uh, the human population growth. So, uh, likely, there will only be more areas that we see issues like this. Um, so, this is a system that would allow us to do this in the future for other areas too. And at this point, is uh, the Hanover deer team of the town of Hanover being um, considered as? Uh, yes. On, yeah, uh, absolutely. As as a candidate yes. for these permits. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you. And there may be some of the team in the audience, or they may speak to the issue. Would you like that at the end of the meeting, or what's your pleasure? Um. Well, Dan's here, do you want, just uh, if they have a question? Yeah, I guess, let's get, we'll give it a try here. I don't <laughs> know. Uh, 
I don't know if there are any in the audience. There, there might not, I did have a, I had an email from someone from the town saying that people might not make it because of yes. the weather, but uh, yeah, if anybody's given me opportunity, happy to answer questions. That's fine. No, they're okay. not. Uh, thank you. Yeah, if they did have something pertinent to oh, it, yeah. then. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, thank absolutely. You. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dan. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Christine Rines. I'm the Moose Project Leader. We're going to go over the Moose Season proposal here. So Moose is a little different than the other big game species in that because of the changes that we're seeing, we do do this annually now. So the 2018 Moose Season proposal is uh, the frame, the basic framework is the same it has been for quite some time starting the third Saturday in October and ending nine days later. So before we go over the season, I wanted to give you an update on how the um, research has been going. Um, as you will recall, we did have a pretty significant drought um, in the fall of 2016 that killed off a lot of questing ticks, which was great for moose. So as you can see here in this, um, this particular column are sur survival estimates, which were very low, for calves. And those would be the animals that are calves in the month of April. So they're short yearlings, really. Increased substantially thanks to that reduction in tick load from 20% back up to 70%. And we also had some increase in survival on adults, although adult survival has stayed pretty stable over that time period. Neonates are the newborns up until about 16 weeks of age, and that's also remained stable over this time period. So at the same time, not only did we have a reduction in mortality, we had a bit of an increase in productivity um, and as you can see, we finally saw a tiny bit of cab, uh, twinning rate, um, a bit of an increase in the overall calf <coughs> rate, and a bit of an increase in the percentage of cows that successively calve. So our, the ones that calve last year were able to calve this year. That's what that primarily means. So that was, that was good news. Um, but I would warn you, this is, while this is excellent news, this is still a low productivity rate um, for North America because ticks continue to have some impact. So over the course of the study, um, these are the totals for the uh, animals that we have collared. They collared 50 <coughs> this past, um, well, just a few days ago. In two and a half days, 44 calves and six cows. The tick counts on the collared animals were increased slightly over last year, but still significantly lower than two years ago. The state of Maine collared 83 animals just prior to us. Their tick loads remained the same as they were the year before that. And Vermont was hoping to collar 35. I've not yet heard from them to know uh, how things went. <coughs> So this is what our vehicle kill has been doing um, statewide. We don't have all the reports in yet, but it does look like they went down um, everywhere, pretty much in all regions and overall. So we're down to about 93 statewide. The highest um, number of vehicle kills has always been in this White Mountain region and, and continues to be the, that as well. This is what you're going to see for the proposal slides for the season. So the area that we're talking about is in red. The red line is the goal that is set every 10 years during the 10-year planning process. <coughs> the white line is the estimate of the moose density averaged over two years, what that's done. And the green line, which is new, we uh, instituted that in the last year, last 10-year planning process, is the cutoff. Um, where if the population dropped to that level, we would stop issuing permits there until we saw two years of positive growth that resulted in a 
population that was 13% above the cutoff level. So here in the Connecticut Lakes region, um, up here you have both the proposal in kind of pink and the past two years issuance. These are either sex versus antlerless only permits. Um, we saw some growth here and um, we're, we're recommending that we maintain that permit issuance of, of 10 either sex permits. The north region um, looks worse than it actually is. You can see things continue to go down. But when you look at the annual change, in fact, we saw some growth here this past year. Remember, this is a two-year um, mean over time. So if you look at it just annually, we saw quite a bit of, of growth. Um, this is our, our one of the highest densities of moose that we have, but unfortunately, this is also where we start to see short winters. And it's that relatively high moose density coupled with short winters that is creating a big impact. This is also where the bulk of our study lies. So we're recommending um, that we maintain that, that permit issuance at 15 either sex permits. White Mountains is pretty much flat. It hasn't really changed over the past five years, a little growth, a little decline, but pretty much the same as it has been. Um, and we're recommending we stay the course there at 15 either sex permits. The Central, where there's life, there's hope. Oh my gosh, we saw some growth here after a long, steady decline. Um, and we are recommending that we issue the same e six either sex permits here. The Southwest, um, we are actually, this slide is incorrect. We are proposing that we maintain zero um, permits issued here. So this, we actually hit the cutoff point last, last season. We did see growth though. If that growth continues, there's a good chance we will open things back up next year. And the Southeast, um, we are recommending we remain at five uh, either sex permits there. Um, it's pretty flat. It's, in fact, it's completely flat <coughs> growth rate there. So this is what it looks like um, when you look at it regionally, the last column is this proposal and on the bottom we're recommending one hunt of a lifetime permit be issued and one wildlife heritage foundation permit for a total of 53 permits total those last two permits those people can hunt anywhere in the state that they choose aside from the southwest and this is what it looks like when you break it down regionally not a lot of permits issued really anywhere And that is that. Does anyone have any questions? What, is, what was the percentage of take last year of the 53 permits issued? Um, so 67% is what I want to say. We, we, yeah, it was 37 total permits were filled. A lot of work for 37 animals, isn't it? It is. Wow. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Andrew Timmons. I'm the department's bear project leader, so I'll be covering uh, the bear proposals today for the next two um, hunting seasons. And I'll start. Um, I know so, so we have some new folks here, so just, just quickly, in New Hampshire we manage bears across six management regions, so, that, so we have six different regions. Um, and when you look at harvest over time, you know our harvest all in all has gone up over time considerably. 2016 we saw a record bear harvest, 898. This past year due to abundant foods, we had a more um, what I'd consider more, a more average New Hampshire bear harvest, and it was just shy of 600. As far as hunter effort, um, we continue to see growth in the number of bear licenses sold each year. Um, 
this doesn't yet have 2017 data, but we're, we're generally selling around 10,700 bear licenses a year. Um, where we're really seeing um, the growth in interest is mostly in baiting, but to some degree still hunting. Um, effort by houndsmen has been more stable over time. And as far as conflicts go, although there's a lot of peaks and valleys to this graph, we still maintain uh, we have stabilized bear complaints. We have less on average now than we had 20 and 30 years ago. And 2017 conflict data is still preliminary, but it's looking like 2017 will likely be the lowest year in terms of bear human conflicts that we've had in 25 years. So, so things are, you know, it was a really good summer. So now I'll get into um, the proposals. And I'll start with the north region and, and all these graphs for these six regions have a red line which represent the current goal as expressed in our, as dictated in our big game management plan. The blue line is what the population has done over time. So um, the season recommendations will be based largely on where we are in reference to our goal. So here in the north, although we're slightly below, um, that's close enough that we feel comfortable maintaining this season, the bear hunting season in the north at the, at the same season structure that we've had for quite a number of years now. And that's a baiting season that's four weeks long, runs most of the month of September. Our hound season, and this is a, a statewide hound season for, for all regions that allow that method, um, that's no change to previous. That's a 51 day hound hunting season which will run 51 consecutive days prior to the start of the deer rifle season. So you can see the dates there. And then the still hunting season in the north, we're proposing the same season we've had in place. That's a season that opens the 1st of September and runs to the end of the deer muzzleloader season. Moving on to the, to the White Mountains. Um, this, is a, this is an area we have a little work to do. As you can see, our population has continued to grow above the goal. Um, historically, we've had a four-week baiting season in the White Mountains. Um, we're proposing adding a, a week to that, so going with five weeks of baiting in the, in the White Mountain region, which is, this is new ground for us. We've never had a baiting season anywhere in the state that's gone mo more than four weeks, so proposing adding seven days. The hound hunting season is the same that I described in the north. In the still hunting season, we're proposing adding a week there as well. So this this late closing date on the still hunting season allows deer, opportunistic deer hunters to take a bear for, for the first three full weeks of the deer firearm season. So that, that's, a, that's a new change as well. Central region, um, we've been growing, we've, we've stabilized at least in the, in the very recent past. The other thing that happened is in 2015 when we, we redid the big game management plan, the goal in that region dropped from 0.6 <coughs> to 0.5 bears per square mile. So you can see the, the deficit we need to, to make up over the life of the plan. Here, um, we've had a three week baiting season in place. We're proposing adding a fourth week to the baiting season in the central. Um, that same hound hunting season that I've described and a still hunting season that mirrors that proposed for the White Mountains, which will overlap with deer firearm season for three weeks. Southwest One is, is a real nice region to manage. We're always right at goal. Proposing same season structure, a three week baiting season, 51 day hound hunting season, and a still hunting season that mirrors that seen in the north, uh, proposed in the north, which will run from the 1st of September and overlap with the entire deer muzzleloader season. And down in Southwest too, um, we've reached the goal and we've been at goal for a while. Despite the fact that we're at goal, um, there, there's a lot of interest for a, a longer season down there. Historically, the, we've had a three week baiting season and a four week still hunting season. Um, we're proposing keeping the baiting season at three weeks. Um, hounds are not utilized down here. Um, primarily because of the road densities really preempt the use of hounds in that part of the state. In the still hunting season, we're proposing adding 14 days to that season um, from the previous, so that would bring it to October 12th. So that'd be a six week still hunting season as opposed to the previous four. 
In southeast, um, our objective here is to maintain a low, very low bear density, which we've effectively done. Um, for ease, what we tend to do here is to mirror the season length of the southwest too, so that we have uniform seasons across the whole southern part of the state. For that reason, proposing the same season as in the southwest two, three weeks of baiting and six weeks of still hunting. Very few bears are taken down here. The length of the season really doesn't matter that much. Um, on any given year, you're either going to take between zero and two, maybe three bears out of this entire region. Some additional proposals. The first one's really just for ease of data collection. It's to modify the current bait farmer permit and add a checkoff to indicate that that permit is associated with the Connecticut Lakes Headwater Forest Lottery. So it'll be a checkoff so the person when they're filling out that bait form for, for purposes of the site that they were awarded through the lottery, they'll just check that box and also ask that they write the unit number for which they were selected on the bait permit form. Simply helps on our end track which permit goes with, with which applicant. Um, We've been measuring teats on female bears for quite a number of years, but there's a lot of measurement error associated with that measurement. For that reason, um, it, it decreases my ability to utilize that data. Um, so proposing getting rid of that requirement, um, I can obtain data that will fill that need through um, premolar analysis by, by the laboratory that we send it out. It's basically used to develop reproductive histories on bears. Um, the, this proposal um, comes to us from the New Hampshire Bear Hunters Association and it's a proposal that we as a um, division are supporting um, and that's to change the start of the hound training season from the current July 15th to the 1st of July. Um, we would have some concerns if it was any earlier in July. Most states that allow the training of bear dogs during the summer, very few open prior to July 1st. Making this change will still allow us to be um, either more liberal or consistent with about 70% of the states that um, have similar rules. Um, closing date would be the same, the end of August. And an advantage of this proposal is that the first two weeks in July represent a period of time that dovetails with some of our, our peak period of conflicts between bears and people. And having houndsmen out um, operating training bears during that time period could could help in um, alleviate some of those issues. So um, it's not one we have a biological concern over. So we're we're um, proposing a July one opener, and that covers it for bear. If there's any questions, Commissioner um, McGonigal, changing it from July 15 to July one, they actively pursue no, changing no, during that period. It is warm. Um, that time you get there. They're, they're operating early yeah. morning or late in the evening. Um, not much is going on during the peak of the day. Um, the, the heat wouldn't be good for bears all the time. So it's a, it's a morning evening activity. Andy, I have, I have a question for you on uh, Southwest One. Yep. Um, I've get, been getting for several years now quite a few complaints about the bear density in this kind of a south, southwest or southeast end of that unit, mm -hmm. you know, around Stoddard, Wimster, yeah. that area of, a, of a exceptionally high bear population. Yeah. Um, has it been looked at to see, being that you're changing southwest to and southeast, Added lengthening the still hunting days. Has it been looked at to lengthen the days in Southwest One also? Being the populations are really very similar in the goals. They're are similar. similar, and the goals are similar. But the difference is, you know, we already have a pretty long bear hunting season in Southwest One. I mean, it, it mirrors what we have in the north. Um, <coughs> because we're at goal there and been at goal, we haven't really tempered too much. And as you're probably aware, there are some, <coughs> there are some activities that historically have gone on and started, such as bear feeding. 
that would unduly influence bear densities in that particular area. So, you know, that may not be all of it, but that might help explain why if you're in Stoddard, you're seeing more than perhaps are in other areas. But the bottom line is because we've been at goal, and it's already a fairly lengthy season there, um, we, we haven't talked about extending the season. Okay. Well, I mean, right, the way it is now, would it be as long as it is in H2? The south, it's H2. the southwest right, one southwest season. One would southwest one season. The season goes okay. till, um, All right, it so goes into November, as opposed to the second week in October, which is what the proposal for south. Okay, so it's I, already two months longer. Yeah, I, I misread when you went through that. I yeah. was thinking that it was stopping before Southwest 2 did. No, no, no. Which didn't seem to make any sense. No, no it'll, go to the, it'll go to the end of the deer muzzleloader season, which is the, um, okay. the 6th of November. All right. Okay. Um, anybody have any other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you wait. Our turkey project leader, Ken Walski, is with us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Kent Gustafson. I'm the Wildlife Program's supervisor, so I will be, no pun intended, I'll wing this and then see how it comes out. Uh, the current turkey regulations, almost all of you are familiar with those. We have a spring gobbler season that runs May 3rd to May 31st, uh, the hours. Uh, the spring season is shotguns only. Uh, we have a turkey youth hunt that we've had for many years, which occurs on the first weekend prior to the opening of the regular spring gobbler season. Uh, fall archery <coughs> season, which corresponds to the uh, archery deer seasons in the state, and a fall shotgun season, which is typically the seven days I think the seven days prior to the last weekend of the moose season or something like that. Uh, and the fall shotgun season uh, is only open in the more southern units of the state. Uh, units A, B, C1, C2, E, and F are closed. Uh, this just gives a summary of the turkey harvest for this past year. Uh, primarily the harvest is occurring in the southern part of the state. The units on the left, uh, A to G, uh, are more or less in the northern part of the state with the exception of D2 and uh, G, which are in the Connecticut River Valley. And both of those are uh, typically have fairly high harvests. <laughs> but the bulk of the harvest is com comprised in the southern part of the state. Uh, units H1, H2, I1, I2, J1, J2, K, L, and M. Uh, last year, the spring season resulted in a take of about 4,482 birds. Uh, we've been typically averaging around 4,000 to 4,500 birds a year, so that's about par for the course. The uh, fall season take last year was 466. That's down from what it has been lately, but uh, there were very abundant fall foods in the woods last year, and turkeys were simply not being seen out in the open and in the fields as much as they normally would be uh, for hunters to take advantage of at that time of the year. Uh, turkey are also managed based on the, uh, our game management plan. Uh, this first column over here is a unit specific objective uh, which we measure in terms of the uh, dollar kill per square mile of habitat in each unit. Uh, the second column is the kill per square mile of habitat that was achieved in 2017. And for each of those units, there is a hunting strategy. And the hunting strategy is also defined in the plan. 
uh, those towns that have a, or units that have a conservative hunting strategy are generally low population towns, low turkey population towns, and the conservative hunting strategy would basically allow for spring hunting and a fall archery season. For those units that have better habitat and a better turkey population, uh, there's a moderate hunting strategy associated with those. And when the uh, uh, fall or the spring kill per square mile exceeds a half a bird or 0.5 birds per square mile, uh, there's an opportunity in those towns to have a fall shotgun season as well. <laughs> uh, where units with uh, high, high turkey numbers have a liberal strategy and in towns where the uh, turkey, or keep saying <coughs> towns, I'm getting like Ted, I think on the basis of towns <laughs> rather than wildlife management units, uh, where the kill exceeds 0 0.75 uh, birds per square mile, there's an opportunity for even further liberalizing the season with perhaps the possibility of a second gobbler in the spring or a lengthening of the fall, uh, fall shotgun season beyond its current seven days. So where we are right now is you'll note that in the southern part of the state typically we are averaging over close to or over 0.75 birds per square mile in many if not all of those more southern units whereas some of the northern ones are very uh, low kill in the nor no most northern areas of the state. This is just a summary of the spring harvest over the last 10 years. You can see that uh, we have been as high as over about 4,550, but typically it runs right around 4,000 to 4,500. Uh, the fall harvest uh, averages somewhere in the neighborhood of 750 over the long term. I wanted to point one thing out here. These are the northern units of the state. And in past years, there has been a fall shotgun season in unit D2, whereas you can see the kill per square mile in the rest of these units is far less than 0 0.5, where there has not been a fall shotgun season. Uh, in the recent most recent two years, 2006 and 2007, we've seen that kill per square mile in unit D1 drop below 0.5. And that's going to impact the proposals for that particular unit. Turkey is a little unique in that for some of these proposals, uh, we're not talking about what's going to be taking effect for 2018 uh, because the rules won't be completed by the time the youth hunt and the spring gobbler season begin. So some of these things will stay the same for the 2018 spring season and our proposed changes won't take effect until the 2019 spring season. So for 2018, we'll be maintaining the status quo. Uh, May 3rd to May 31st, uh, again it would be shotguns with an annual bag limit of one gobbler or bearded bird. However, in beginning in 2019, we're proposing to open the season on May 1st uh, to come into uh, agreement basically with some of our neighboring states as far as the season opener is concerned. A statute that was passed in the not too distant past allowed uh, the use of crossbows during any season that's open, uh, any firearm season, so that a crossbow could be used as a lesser weapon during a firearm season. 
and we're proposing to allow the use of crossbows during that spring uh, gobbler season so that shotguns or crossbows would be a legal weapon. In much of the state, particularly the southern part, uh, turkeys are doing very well and we think that now we have the opportunity to actually offer uh, an increased bag limit during that spring uh, gobbler season. So we're proposing that the annual bag limit be increased to two birds during the May gobbler season. However, uh, we would still continue to issue two tags uh, with the turkey license so that a hunter would have the opportunity to take one gobbler between May 1st and May 15th and a second gobbler uh, between May 16th and 31st. Uh, that second bird could only be taken in the southernmost units, H1, H2, J2, K, L, or M. Uh, we don't want people being able to take two birds in the first two weeks of the season simply to spread the hunting pressure out across the entire month. If they are unsuccessful in the first 15 days when the bulk of the hunting pressure occurs, they could take two gobblers during the second two weeks of May, between the 16th and the 31st. Again, the second bird would have to be taken in one of those six southern wildlife management units. And for those people who are unable to take two birds in the spring or enjoy, enjoy the opportunity to bow hunt for turkeys in the fall, they would have the option to take one gobbler between May 1st and 31st and one bird during either of the fall seasons. So it provides quite a bit of extra turkey hunting opportunity uh, across at least parts of the state. The youth turkey season, this is another one that no change would occur in 2018. Uh, however, in 2019, again, because this is a firearm season, we're proposing that uh, use of crossbows be legal uh, during the youth turkey hunt as well. Uh, the fall seasons, there's no proposed changes to the uh, fall archery season for 2018 and two, 2019. However, we are proposing that both in 2018 and 19, again, shotguns or crossbow would be legal. However, the units that would be closed to hunting would now include unit D1, since that's also dropped below uh, the 0 0.5 birds uh, per square mile threshold. And that's it for turkeys. If anybody has any questions, I'll uh, try to answer them. Uh, I'm getting an awful lot of pressure from up my way, A and B. Uh, when I came down this morning, Nobody lived like that. There were turkeys everywhere up there. Everywhere. Yeah. And everybody's telling me there's turkeys everywhere. So why you, you have developed uh, the population of turkeys up in those units by kill per square mile, right? Right. Do you take into consideration how to density? Well, we haven't in all honesty. And clearly the number of people hunting turkey up north is undoubtedly considerably less than it is in J2, L, or M. So, so that is something we could try to look at. That being said, if you have less people out there trying to kill turkeys, they're not going to kill turkeys, so the kill ain't going to yeah. be per square acre. So um, you don't have an accurate projection of what the turkey population is up there. But I think I'd like to have it looked at because uh, we got an awful lot of turkeys up there. I think they're Vermont turkeys. No tell Ted I said that. But I, I, I think they came over from, from Vermont. Vermont had a, had a very strong program up north. They released a lot up north. And I think they just flew across the road, to be honest with you. 
Now on, on, the, on the main side of, of my county up there, I can't speak for that because I haven't had any calls from over there, but I have along the Connecticut River. Uh, there is a high density of, of turkeys. All right. Yeah, we will take a look at that and see what, uh, what what the thoughts are on that subject as we go forward with input from the regions and the districts. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Thank you. Have you modeled the anticipated impact of increasing the bag limits on both the harvest and population? Ted has looked at the effects in other states uh, that have that second bird, uh, and I'm not personally familiar with what he's found out here, but uh, typically uh, it's not, well, I shouldn't say that it doesn't have any impact, but it does. But the second bird in the, second gobbler in the bag in the spring has less impact on the population than additional hunting opportunity in the fall because that allows for the taking of hens or toms. So a second gobbler in the bag may take more adult males out of the population, but it's not removing females, uh, which impact the population's ability to recover from the hunt. So, and a lot of people, uh, I'd say a majority of people who have wanted additional opportunity would prefer the second bird in the spring as opposed to more opportunity in the fall. Anybody else? Thank you, Ken. Oh, snuck up on me. <laughs> Hi, my name is Patrick Tate. I'm the Fur Bear Project Leader. I'll be presenting the Fur Bear Fur Biological Information and the Fur Bear Proposals for the Game Management Team, our wildlife division. There's a few species that we looked at, um, one of those being our fisher, and we use what's called capture per unit effort to <coughs> get a, an idea of what's going on with populations, <coughs> fur bear populations. So effort is the number of trap nights set in the state. In regards to fishery, the season is December 1st through December 31st for trap. And some look at trapping licenses, that's not good effort because depending on the variables that affect persons who trap, their interest getting out there, you can have a high fluctuation of trap nights. So with the, what we do is we divide out the number of animals captured per 100 trap nights. And for today's purposes, um, for what we're doing, we're looking at the three-year capture per unit effort. Reason being is you can have yearly variables within the environment and within um, humans' decisions of what they do that can affect uh, capture per unit effort. So down, you see a jagged line here, it goes up and down, that's the annual. And when you do a three-year, it averages out more. So, with that said, you can see a, a decline over time with our fisher indices, and you can see our take went, went way down. Um, our take has gone way down in part because people just didn't go out last, last year particularly go out. Um, and, that, and you can see our, our CPUE actually went up, but overall negative trend. Our gray fox indices, um, gray fox are an inter interesting species that their average home range is one square mile. So the take on gray fox mirrors effort very much because um, within the Hampshire you need landowner permission to set traps. The landowner size shapes of New Hampshire and whatnot, there's just very um, diluted traps set on the landscape. So when an animal is removed from its home range, you don't see a massive influx in, in, with the season length and other capture. So it correlates with effort very good. But right around this, where you, where you start seeing this decline, we notice a breakout in effort versus captures. And in 2016, we sent an animal for testing because it was actually rabies testing. It came up rabies negative. It wasn't understood what was going on. We sent it for additional testing. It came back with canine distemper. Other states in um, Vermont particularly had sent some gray fox as well. It came back as distemper. 
this past summer, I, um, fall I sent an animal, came back with this temper. It appears that um, in our great fox population and our red, fo our red fox population, a few other things, our fish are, are being affected by <coughs> canine distemper and we're, up, we're talking about upping our disease surveillance there and looking at other um, habitat parameters that may be causing these declines. Our red fox, they average about a two to three square mile home range. Uh, another interesting thing about this species is the presence of predators on the landscape can affect their abundance. And if you look in the historical data going back in the 80s when eastern coyotes started getting a, a stronger hold on the landscape, a sharper decline in red fox. But yet we see this, this trend of decreasing. Um, we know over time our habitat has changed. We know our predators on the landscape has changed. We know we have uh, epidem an epidemic going on with uh, distemper. So going to look at our disease issues um, and our habitat issues that could be affecting this. So our proposals. Currently for our fisher trapping, uh, it is de December 1st through December 31st. And a person who wishes to hunt fisher, it would be December 1st through January 31st. What we're proposing to do is shorten our hunting season for January 1st to January 31st statewide. Our trapping season would be shortened one week and it'd go from December 1st to December 21st. There would continue to be a five fisher bag limit statewide, though no more than three fisher from the combined area of C1, D2, E, F, G, H, I, J and K. Um, reason being is looking at the data, our north region up here in our southeast corner has not seen the uh, same effects in capture per unit efforts as other parts of the state. Our red and gray fox, our current hunting season is September 1st to March 31st. Our trapping season is October 15th to December 31st in unit A through F, which is right through the white, above the White Mountain areas where it divides. Um, that's due to winter differences and the timing of freeze up. And the southern um, zone currently is November 1st through January 15th. Our proposal is to create a, a shortened hunting season for November 1st through December 31st statewide and shorten trapping October 15th to December 15th in units A through F and November 1st through December 31st in um, G through M. Our Eastern Coyote um, Game Management Team proposal is to align more along with what we do with other species and remove any human pressures on the population during um, pup rearing. So currently hunting is no closed season. Night hunting is allowed January 1st through March 31st. And what we're proposing is a season July 15th through March 31st statewide. Night hunting allowed January 1st through March 31st. With that, those are our proposals on FAR. Okay, I might as well stat this one off, Pat. I've got a bunch of questions, but I'll just give you a couple right now and give these guys a chance. Um, according to article in the Union Leader, um, we're one of 42 states that allows coyote hunting all year. Is that correct? Um, so, I haven't looked at all the other states in the entire country that allow all year hunting. Uh, I've looked in the city around us, and right our next door neighbors being named Vermont allow year round hunting. Massachusetts has a restricted season. Uh, some states to the south have very liberal seasons, but like a one year closure and things like that. So the state of New Hampshire falls um, currently on the very liberal side of things, but not out of the norm of what other states are doing. Um, I've looked at some western states and found that they allow year-round hunting of coyotes as well. Okay. Are, are our coyote populations in jeopardy or something? I mean, what's promoting this whole proposal? So, Mark, do you want to help me answer that? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, we were petitioned, as you know, um, at a previous public hearing to consider a closure 
uh, during the pupping season. The uh, collective mindset of the game management team was to the extent we accommodate that and other species, to the extent our deer population is thriving, um, uh, and to the extent, generally speaking, we don't think we can, in compelling fashion, justify allowance to take during pupping season to the general public. We thought it was prudent to uh, respond to that petition by truncating it a bit, but suggesting that uh, a closure during the pupping season was a reasonable consideration for the commission. So, so we'll put that on the table for you. Okay, so has there been any any documented studies done on eastern coyotes that that shows that there's a significant um, loss of pups due to hunting during this time period? I, I think I would say um, probably not, but clearly if you kill an adult that those pups are dependent on, there will be a loss of pups. The extent of coyote take during that season or period is, a, is unknown, likely very low, and so, so you could argue that it has no impact on the sporting community or very little impact and as a consequence of we could accommodate it. Depends on your perspective if you stand there and look at both ways. Commissioner Carr? Either Pat or, or, uh, or Mark. How many coyotes are in New Hampshire? We don't know. We, we do not. Uh, that's my point. Uh, is there any plans to do a study to try to get that population number? No, we don't know how many turkeys there are. We don't know how many fishers there are. Well, what's the methodology that you might use to, to find out how many coyotes are in the state? We would uh, index rather than do a total count through catch per unit effort. And if you look at the data in the harvest summary, you'll see that the coyote population has, uh, by that standard, uh, been reduced historically and moderated in recent years. So we have no idea what the, what the harvest is either. We don't know how many we have, but we don't know what the harvest is, correct? We know what it is during the uh, coyote trapping season, but uh, um, Pat, correct me if I'm wrong, but hunter take is not uh, obligatory in terms of registration. Where did this come from? Was this an internal proposal from, from wildlife or did this come from somebody else uh, as, outside the organization? As I mentioned earlier, you were petitioned, legally petitioned through the, uh, through the regulatory okay. process to consider this. All right, do you have that petition? Um, I, I'm sure Paul has a copy of that. And that petition is just named? No, no, it's a request through the rulemaking process for I'd us. I'd like to have that petition, please. Yep. I don't see how we can make propose a change where we have scant information about how many, what the population is, and how many are taken. You know, we did a bobcat proposal that took a five-year study that showed specific information, and we were able to make reasonable proposals, and everybody knows the history of that. But that's the kind of information I'm looking for. I, quite frankly. I'm not going to consider this proposal unless I have something that I can sink my teeth into other than a petition that somebody wants to do it. Right. We appreciate that. It is your call. The thing I would encourage you to consider is um, the, uh, the likely uh, discussion that will ensue as a consequence of that decision, whether or not you're comfortable defending the allowance of take during a period where you know there could and likely is impacts on cubs if those well, animals. I'm always good. willing to be enlightened, but I want to see something other than one, a one-page piece of paper asking for a proposal. Right. Understood. And that's, that's your uh, prerogative. We respect that. Very good. Yep. Thank you. Anybody else today any comments? Okay. Well, I've got a couple more yeah, here. I, 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 All right. I got, I got a question. Okay. Commissioner Stoll. Why? Why would the fish are getting the balance from this proposal, which you're, you're, you're proposing here, why would we propose to protect the most efficient predator we have out there? They're not so predators. They hunt in pack. They're, they're very good. They're, they're not a bobcat all by itself. They're a, they're, they're a, they're a, they're a, they're a vicious, vicious pack out there. How, why, why, why would we protect them and put our deer and our other smaller wildlife in, in danger? I, I don't, I don't understand that. Yeah. So uh, 
I, I guess what I would say is that we have common values that we apply across all species. Um, the fact that it's an efficient predator that doesn't make it, in our mind, a, 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 uh, an animal that needs to be removed from the landscape. Um, I would add that the, the deer population is thriving in terms of historic perspective. So if the justification to allow for take during the pupping season is that there would be an adverse impact on deer, I think you'd find yourself on the wrong end of that debate. The deer population argues otherwise. Um, this is not about our personal feelings regarding the value of animals. Rather, it is just a broadly held view by the profession that predators and non-predators, predators and prey, are, are uh, valuable components for a landscape. Clearly, coyotes are here for the long haul, and it's arguable as to whether or not they weren't here prior to our recognizing that. We displaced wolves, coyotes have filled that niche. They are arguably the eastern wolf at this point in time, and we're very comfortable proposing to you to consider a little different mindset to the extent there'll be uh, likely marginal <coughs> impacts on individuals who would be inclined to take coyotes uh, during that period and given the uh, argument that's likely to ensue with the public I think it's worth your consideration as to whether or not you should close for a brief amount of time the coyote hunting during that period. We've done the same thing with trapping and, uh, and we've done it with all species that we manage. So it's not unreasonable to be considered. Sure. This isn't a personal opinion, it's not my personal opinion. My 30 years as a game one, I went out and worked with a deer biologist up north. We, we did deer mortality lines censuses back then. I don't think they do it now, but there was evidence from, from them more than me, the deer biologists back at that time, that the coyotes follow the does during birthing time. When the, when the farms are dropped, the coyotes are right there taking right care of them. Why, why are we proposing to protect that group of animals that do that? I mean, what's more important to us, the deer or the coyote? I, I think that depends on personal values. Uh, from the from the economic perspective, clearly deer are. But again, I would remind you, uh, the deer population is doing very well. You've demonstrated an ability to manage deer in the context of the existing environment. Um, I, I I think it's hard hard to argue against a brief closure to accommodate pup rearing when, in fact, we have no evidence to indicate it would imp impose on our sporting community who we in very high esteem, um, and in fact, you could argue we're trying to safeguard their good reputation with the public by avoiding a debate that are, may or may not um, favor their interests. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, it's under my skin. Can I have one more? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> if we were strict from July 15th to March 31st, the killing of, of adults. Uh, excuse me, just so you know. The season would run from July 15th through March 31st. Okay, let's, let's go the other way. Okay. From March 31st to July 15th. If we prevent people from killing coyotes back then, the deer herd may not keep going up. You, the, the population of coyotes will keep going up and allow more coyotes to follow the does around to, to, to get the, the farm. Is that a fair, fair assumption? Uh, it, it is an assumption. I'm not sure if it's likely to unfold in that fashion. Um, and if it did, of course, we could respond. But uh, I, I will tell you that I'm not aware of any active component of our constituency pursuing coyotes uh, during that time of year. I don't doubt that some do, but uh, my sense is most coyote management occurs during the winter months um, when people are more traditionally pursuing coyotes. I don't believe the uh, the late spring and uh, and early summer is that peak. In fact, we and we'd be interested to hear. Of course, this is draft concept. If there's large numbers of constituents feel they'd be adversely impacted by that closure, then I would encourage them to come forward. We're open to hearing from them. But uh, as far as uh, deer on uh, coyotes on deer, I'd just say that uh, some of the people who I believe you're referencing as having had those observations are party to our existing game team deliberations and uh, my experience is they're generally supportive. 
they're not they're not existent biologists. Uh -huh. so they're, they're retired now. As a matter of fact, one of them's dead. But yeah, okay. thank you, thank you, Mr. You're Chair. Welcome. I'm good. You good? Okay. Um, now I like, I've got one comment here just to kind of answer Max one of Max's questions. Um, there's an amazing amount of coyotes taken during turkey season. I mean that's. You know, I can't speak for the whole rest of this period, but as far as uh, coyotes taken in this proposed closure, that would include all the turkey season. And turkey hunters do take a lot of coyotes because a lot of coyotes come in on turkey hunters. Uh, I have heard from experts, so they say, that the more coyotes you kill, more coyotes you're going to have. How did that work? Yeah, I think that's probably. Oh, yeah. there's a coyote expert out there that gives talks that says if you kill a lot of coyotes, <coughs> it's going to increase the number of coyotes you have. Yeah, I just speak briefly to that. If you have ten coyotes and you kill nine, you clearly won't have more as a consequence. So it really, it really depends on on what level of yeah. pressure is applied to population. But the concept is, there are alpha couples in the coyote world, if you release some of those, that releases subordinate animals to breed in ways they wouldn't normally, yeah, and in that so context, hard. those non-breeders can become breeders, and you can end up with more red and less young. That's, that's, that, that's essentially what you're hearing. Can I add a little bit? Please do. That's a theory. That's, that's a theory. theory. That's a theory. Okay. There's nothing in the science that says that. And if you read about um, coyote management and the take of coyotes, the, the, the residing population that lives has a higher fitness. So you can apply this concept to any fur bearer, any, any herbivore, anything. You take out the population, the remaining animals have more food, the, the fitness of the female <coughs> increases, and the average young per female increases. However, that does not mean the population <coughs> increases. So there's a, there's a leap of faith there saying that that occurs. Um, hunting and trapping can certainly manage coyote populations and influences them. So there's another thing going on amongst the public in the definition of what the word control is. Um, part of the population of people defines control as removing an animal off the landscape. And the other part of the po human population defines control as managing highs and lows of the population. And there's a huge misunderstanding amongst the public of what the word control means. So. Um, if some people say hunting can't control coyotes, and what they're really saying is hunting can't wipe coyotes off the face of the earth, and I'd say I agree to that. But I will also say hunting can control coyotes in that it can keep populations from coming up too high and those issues that come along. So it's all a play on words. And, and just another opinion, if in this state the number of coyotes that we have, we don't know how many we have, but don't you think that we should try to keep that population in check or down from where it is now? Um, I look at, looking at me, so I say, with what Mark alluded to is it comes down to societal beliefs on predators and prey relationships and what those levels of each should be at and what human influence should be on wildlife populations. I don't see that it's as a, a biological yeah, question and as a biologist. This, I, I is, a, this is a social question. It is. It's not question. a biology question. <laughs> <laughs> Just a point, this is from a neighboring state. Back in 12, 2012, 13, and 14, their, their deer uh, population had been severely impacted by coyotes, according to them. Uh, this particular area, over those three years, took out over 400 coyotes, and the deer population has exploded and rebounded. So you can look at it that from that perspective as well. Yeah, and I, I, would, uh, I would acknowledge, I think uh, there is a capacity there for for coyotes to have an adverse impact on deer, um, uh, particularly when you have a low density of deer and a coyote's established dominance over that population, I can well imagine that that could occur. I just uh, reiterate that we're not there at this point in time, and so uh, the discussion should sort of be put in the context of, uh, of, of where we've been. I, I, I believe most of the record deer take that we've had in the history of our management program since 1922 have occurred in the last 10 or 20 years here in New Hampshire. We're riding highs with black bears, turkeys, white-tailed deer, 
you know, a number of other species. So, uh, you know, that's the context. Uh, again, I would say, uh, very respectfully, we fully understood that putting this on the table would be controversial. We think it's a topic that needs to be discussed. We understand it could be imposed on us if we don't discuss, discuss it as a group and deal with it in some responsible fashion. My, my fallback position is, um, and, and again, I recognize that turkey hunters do, a, a, do take some guidance as to whether or not it's a huge number. I, I, I don't know because we don't, can't document that. Um, but as it stands, it seems uh, modest numbers of animals are taken. You want to weigh that against our ability to engage in a public discussion as to whether or not that benefit, which I perceive is probably pretty modest, um, outweighs the, uh, the general values that we apply across all, that, uh, all wildlife, at least uh, our profession does, in terms of offering some protection while they're rearing young. That's the discussion. It is a social issue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I hear a lot of uh, supposition um, uh, being discussed, and I don't think a proposal should simply be made by petition without a study behind it. And I am unaware of any study as to the coyote population or take, like was so well done on uh, the bobcat study. And I would like to see some of that, if that could be done possibly before we make a decision by petition. Um, so I'm wondering if you could speak to the data points you did have available, or you do have available to your team when you made this recommendation. Because it seems like, admittedly, there's not a robust data set for us to use to judge this issue. I'm just wondering if you could describe what is out there that can inform this conversation. Yeah, uh, you're absolutely correct. This is not a, a discussion that can be well informed by existing data sets. We freely acknowledge that. Um, I think the points that informed our discussion, the game team, um, which is, in fairness to the remainder of the department, if you happen to disagree with this proposal, which is a subset of the staff at large, and we've yet to solicit, for instance, law enforcement input, public affairs input on these issues. Generally speaking, um, we don't know what the degree of impact is on coyotes or pups, um, and we're not confident that, uh, that in the absence of that data, it's responsible to allow the take of adults that pups are dependent on. It really is a social discussion, um, in some ways intended to help guide the, the commission towards uh, an awareness of some of the hazards that they will have to contend with if they decide to resist uh, a petition to uh, provide some accommodation for coyotes during the pupping season. What might those hazards be? Um, I think uh, our bobcat experience is a good example of those hazards where we had pretty strong data sets and yet a lack of social support and even though we could argue we're on the high side of the issue biologically, we clearly lost socially because the public in general was not supportive of that proposal. Um, that is the hazard, and it's one that we're going to continue to face perhaps more and more frequently in the future if, if we're not making very measured decisions on how we make decisions. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Being one of the one of the guys sitting at the kid table over here with it with it with kids on the block. So this is for information to me. Is it possible for us the commission to ask or request that this proposal be withdrawn from any further discussion this year without without any any documentation in the back? <coughs> I don't know. I'm asking the question. Well I've I've asked that question and was given an answer that basically is yes. It, but somebody's going to make a motion. Are you making a motion? I am, Mr. Chairman, and, and I'd like to <coughs> answer why I'm making that motion. Okay. I, I, I think without further documentation to really make us look like we know what we're talking about with numbers and whatnot, uh, it would be premature for us to come out with, with a recommendation like this. 
which I think isn't necessary, may not be, I'll, I'll give Mark his due, may not be biologically supported by me, but it, it, I think the public out there right now, if we come out with this, they're saying, what the heck is the fish and game time to do? So the reason that I'm recommending that we pull this out for future discussion this year is simply because of that. Okay, so the motion is to to complete to completely remove the Eastern Coyote section of this proposal for the public hearing. Or, or change it to leave it the way it is. I don't well, know. that would, that would basically be pulling it. Yeah, yeah, that would be removed. So that's that what is. I, that's what I'd like to do. Do I have a second? You do. Okay, Commissioner Carr seconds it. Now we're into discussion. Um, I'm totally in agreement with that. Um, we're supposed to be managing the commission, to the best of my knowledge, we're supposed to be managing game populations and wildlife by the best available science, not by petitions, not by emotions. The only responsible thing in my mind is to be sticking with that. So there's, there's so many issues with this, none of which there's any data on. I mean, supposedly coyotes are pair up and stay paired up, meaning that if one of the pair gets killed, the other pair still takes care of the litter. If they're only not weaned yet, the female doesn't even leave the dam. So the, the, the whole issue of all of these litters of pups dying is, is basically unproven. Um, you know, we can't just be assuming that all these bad things happen and... You need to learn a little bit more about coyotes. For um, one, I've got four right for now. one thing, so the male goes recognize. out and brings the food back to the female. The male goes out, he gets killed, he does not bring the female back her food to raise her pups. Okay. Don't sit there and tell lies. It's okay. not a lie. Yes, it is. And there are studies. There's all mm -hmm. kinds of studies. Okay, well then bring, get me a what document. What we have, we've written. given you tons of information. You don't listen. Documented, written studies I'm going to look at. You I can give you some right now. Would you like it right now, that information? Is it? All right. Okay, I'm going to order. We're in a discussion mode for the commission. This is not time for the public to speak. You have There's a call for the public at the end it's of the not meeting. not a public hearing here. right now. We're not in a public hearing. All right. Don't you want to do what's best for the department? This is not going to be I'm good for the department. I'm trying to do what's best for the department. Okay, we have a motion on the floor, we have a second. We're in discussion. Is there any further discussion? Uh, yes, yes. Um, just real quick. Is it the intent of the motion to assure ourselves that the department will move forward with the study? Or um, are you just saying we're pulling this off and... The motion was to simply pull it pull off. Pull it off. The study would be That's advice. why I asked if it was the intent <laughs> of the motion. Well, the intent of the motion is pull it off. But the reason for the, for the motion is because we have, as a department, we don't know how many files are out there. We don't know whether whether it's actually being, the pups are actually being affected and, and to what degree, on and on and on. And on. I think we would look a little bit silly in front of the public if we went out with this proposal, which I'm saying, personally saying, is going to be a hot topic out there to the general public. If we as a department go out with a proposal without any, any, any backup, reason, we need more data. That's going to be a problem. Yeah, yeah there wasn't sufficient data provided. There's kind of data out there. Uh, my feeling is that if the deer population has been as healthy as it has for the last 10 years, why should we just continue with the same seasons we had for coyotes trying to keep the numbers in check? We do this, the population may increase a lot. We don't know that. But we don't want that. Unless we have substantial evidence that in, in following this proposal, it's going to keep the coyote population down so that our deer population will remain steady. So I see no reason why 
easiest action would be to obligate people to take coyotes to report them to us. So then we could provide you with some sense of whether or not there's actual tape occurring during the period whereby pups might be impacted. That would not be highly complex. But much more than that would probably require that we have uh, collared pairs and uh, the ability to monitor pups that were in those dens during the occurrence of possible mortality, human-induced mortality. It would be pretty complex. I mean, we're glad uh, for your interest in this and glad to pursue it, but anything short of uh, obligatory registration, I could show that there's no take during this sensitive period, in which case you'd have to wrestle with which way to go because the, the implications would satisfy one constituency and have no adverse impact on another. And that, those are the kinds of decisions you're going to be faced with. I, uh, I, I, you know, I defer to the commission. We look for your leadership on this. Um, we're simply, again, trying to keep our, ourselves collectively out of harm's way that we see on the horizon. That's really the, the spirit with which we put this on the table. And I would remind you the petition is not a list of names. Um, uh, some parties who are here today have followed the rules and laws of the state. Paul can speak to best and and forced us collectively through legal means to discuss this issue. That's what it is. And, uh, and you may recall at our meeting uh, that occurred at the ski facility. That's where that that information was requested and these individuals indicated it was at that point that they were going to do what they have subsequently done, which anyone in the public can do. They can petition us to put issues on the table for rulemaking. So. Question for Paul. From a legal standpoint, are we allowed to do this? Okay, sure. Yeah. Just, just to explain what, what this is. As Mark has alluded, uh, the Voices of Wildlife have filed a petition for rulemaking with you, which they're allowed to do under the Administrative Procedures Act. In response to that, staff is bringing this particular proposal before you. You can consider the proposal, you can reject the proposal. In other words, because the petition's filed doesn't mean that you have to grant the petition, it just means you have to consider. Okay? And you certainly are considering it. Okay. So you're meeting your obligations under the uh, Administrative Procedures Act as you considered it. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Ready for a roll. All in favor of the proposal put forward, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? So moved. I'm clear. Is that all you have? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> One more, yeah. Thank you, Pat. Good job. Good 
Good afternoon. My name is Karen Bordell. I'm the Pheasant and Small Game Project Leader. And today we have two proposals for your consideration. Uh, the first one is regarding the pheasant season. Uh, we are proposing opening day of October 1st through December 31st. And because October 1st can be a different day of the week, depending on the calendar, and because of our stocking procedures, with an October 1 opening day, we usually stock two days prior to that, and then we stock a Thursday-Friday scenario once the season begins. So the table <coughs> the proposal is when October 1st falls on one of those seven days of the week, we are proposing that the Thursday-Friday scenario dates, that the season is closed until noontime. That allows us to stock birds and get off the sites. The second proposal is regarding cottontail rabbit and gray squirrel. Currently the existing dates are October 1st to December 31st and for gray squirrel September 1st to October 31st. We are proposing to extend the season for both of those species until January 31st in those wildlife management units um, for cottontail rabbit and all units for gray squirrel. Daily limit is the same, season limit is the same. So, any questions? Um, yeah. Yes, I, uh, I greatly appreciate your adding the month on the gray squirrels. Down in our area, there are a lot of squirrels, and it's literally dozens each time you go from one side of the team to the other that are dead in the road that nobody got to make use for. This is going to help out quite a bit. It's also going to help involving youth into hunting because January is one of those months that you're not competing with soccer, football, any of the other things, and it's easier to get a youth to go out on the weekend and hunt squirrels. So I appreciate that proposal. Anybody else have anything? No? Thank you, Karen. You're welcome. Closing in on it. Uh, non game asked that we include one uh, proposal in this package, and that would be to amend uh, uh, FIS 308.05, uh, et cetera, to include the following on the level two uh, wildlife control operator reports. And these proposals have to do with the exclusion of bats, which are in New Hampshire now essentially either threatened or endangered, every one of them. So if uh, a wildlife control operator is doing bat exclusions between May 15th and May 31st, uh, they need to report if pups are present. And if those bad exclusions are performed between August 1st and August 15th, uh, they need to report if uh, pups were flying for two weeks prior to that exclusion. And then they would also be asked to report any public health related exclusion associated with bats. Uh, does anybody have any questions on that before I move on? Questions? Seeing none, uh, these are just kind of housekeeping things. Uh, Paul <coughs> went through all the rules associated with uh, the game species, and there are a number of these that will be expiring prior to our biennial season setting in 2020. And we thought that uh, rather than frantically try to deal with those over the next two years as they're about to expire, 
uh, we'll simply readopt those uh, with no change at this point in time, and they'll, then they'll be in place for the next 10 years. Uh, some of these are pretty basic. Uh, I'll briefly explain what they are. Uh, the first one, definitions, just uh, defines antlered and antlerless deer, bait, baiting and baited areas. Uh, the deer registration station one and turkey registration station, uh, those rules uh, uh, explain the establishment of registration stations and the requirement of those stations. Uh, rails and gallinules, uh, there's no open season for them and we would be just readopting that rule with no change. Uh, grouse, uh, partridge, chucker partridge, and Hungarian partridge rules, those rules establish the season and bag limit. Uh, we're proposing to readopt <coughs> with no change. Uh, fur dealer records uh, is the record keeping requirements and reporting requirements for fur dealers in the state. Uh, taking beaver and otter by snares, these are the regulations for the use of snares for beaver and otter. Uh, sealing of fur bearing animals, uh, these rules uh, regulate the sealing of fur in the state. And then there's a few in chapter 1100 of the rules. The uh, moose lottery application, uh, these are rules associated with the information that we require on the moose lottery application. Uh, moose permits, uh, that rule is the rule associated with moose permit fees and signature requirements on the permit. Uh, landowner permit for coyote hunting at night, uh, these are the requirements for gaining landowner permission uh, to do that. And the training dogs uh, are the requirements <coughs> associated with obtaining a dog training permit. So for all of those, uh, we're just simply proposing to readopt those with no changes. And that, I believe, is the end. So soon? <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner McGonagall. I make a motion to adopt the uh, Second. expiring rules. <laughs> <laughs> motion made by Commissioner McGonagall, seconded by Commissioner Moss. Any discussion? <laughs> Seeing none. Um, do I have a vote? Yeah. Yeah. Anybody who's in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? So moved.
uh, a request was made at the committee this morning for support of the idea that the commission adopt uh, the report and the positions that were noted on that particular report, report um, until the next meeting of the commission when further legislative updates will be provided. Okay. Lindsay, you had some information? Sure, and um, for those who I haven't met, I'm Lindsay Hamrick, I'm the State Director for the Humane Society of the United States. I apologize, I couldn't be there this morning. Had a conflicting hearing. My understanding is the concern was around the sale of antiques. Is that correct? Uh, more precisely, it had to do with and if, if an individual had uh, as their property uh, one of these particular items that are now being controlled, mm -hmm. both under state and federal law, uh, that person passed away and their estate sought to dispose of those items through an auction. What would be the result of this legislation and federal law? So this legislation doesn't change that process at all. Federal law prohibits the sale in any way, shape, or form, whether through an estate or an auction or a person-to-person -person sale of any of the uh, species that are listed in Senator Waters' bill. So for example, if somebody imports a, a lion's head or a tusk of an elephant legally into the country, they can only do that legally if they, if they sign something that states that they'll never sell it. So those auctions theoretically are in prohibition of federal law currently, um, unless they've gone through a very extensive exemption process, which um, unless the product is more than 100 years old, they're not antique, so they can't be sold. So Senator Waters' bill doesn't change that at all. If it is an antique, there's an exemption in Senator Waters' bill for all antiques, so it's covered in there if it reaches that level. Make sense? You know, on, on the, the auction item, if, if in the state uh, is directed uh, to sell the properties of whoever died, mm -hmm. now if there's an old mount or, or something like that that's less than 100 years old, that cannot be sold by the auctioneer? Not for correct? an endangered species, right. So if there's a mounted, say it's, for example, lion's head and lion is yeah. listed under Senator Waters bill, um, if that animal was originally imported under an understanding that they would never be used for commercial sale. So there can't be any exchange of money for that item in any way, shape, or form. Unless you can prove that that lion's head came in. Um, either under the Endangered Species Act, it has to be 100 years ago. Under CITES rules, it has to be the year before CITES listed it. So for lions, I think they were listed in the 70s. Now the proof has to come from the auctioneer? Yeah, you'd have to dig up um, all of the people work that the person imported the trophy to begin with, um, and then they would have to show that um, through the auction process. Yeah. And See, that was my concern law. this morning, that yeah. the auctioneers invariably uh, take do estates and have to do all the property in an estate, and they say to whoever's executing me, they say, no, I can't do that, I can't do that. <coughs> I just wondered if that was covered, but it isn't. Senator Waters' bill say it will be illegal to do that. Is that correct? It's it, yeah. His his bill doesn't change federal law, and so federal law already prohibits the sale of those items. Um, his bill does state an exemption for antiques. Usually, when we see this, it's because um, somebody has uh, antique ivory, like an, a small antique yeah. ivory piece. So that is exempted in in his bill. Can you gift them? That's a good question. I think I think that you can give them. You can't exchange any financial monetary value for them. That's a good question. I can look it up for you too. Right. So I'm good. curious. <clears throat> the uh, I know several people. I gave um, Senator Waters one example this morning, but people who have um, tusks, ivory. Whale's teeth, such like, all of which was acquired long before CITES mm -hmm. existed, none of which is 100 years old, but certainly long before CITES existed as an organization, never mind, you know, had control dates like for lines. So what's the, in some, in some instances there's documentation which, um, you know, establishes 
when the animal was taken. In other cases, for example, my uncle was stationed in the Aleutians in the early 1960s and had all kinds of Eskimo stuff from walruses and whales. And uh, yeah, uh, whales' teeth and whatnot. So totally legally taken. So where does that sit? So if a, if a trophy or a part or a skin has come into the country legally, during that period of time before CITES had control over it. Uh, and there's documentation, so there would need to be some proof. The bill doesn't say documentation currently, but in order to enforce it, you have to prove that the, the item is antique. So there's an antique exemption. Right, but that. you define antique as being 100 years old. So I'm talking about things that are not 100 years old, but clearly were taken back at a time when it was. So the antique being 100 years old is the exemption under the ESA to sell the product, not to bring it in. So one of the things that we discussed with Paul was there are, there's a guideline from federal law about how to interpret the antique portion of all of these state laws. And it's a five page document. I'd be happy to give it to you. Um, under your example, there's nothing prohibiting you from having that in your possession. Okay. Right, and none of these are brought in. Well, they were. Well, of course, obviously in Alaska they weren't brought in. They were in the country taken. Um, the 110-pound elephant tusks that I had an example of this morning were brought into the country in the 1950s when the animal was taken. And uh, <clears throat> so again, that that's documented as far as the time goes, but. It, no, that strikes me as being in limbo somewhere unless there's... No, so you're right. So if there's documentation and it was prior to those dates, then you're exempt from Senator Watersville. You're exempt from the federal the federal law. There's always an antique exemption to that. Unfortunately, the, the flip side of that is that wildlife traffickers know that there's an antique exemption, so they use it to Well, right. Anyone's going to try to feed something into the system if possible. But no, Senator Watersville doesn't change anything about what federal law already discusses. It has the same normal exemption that most state bills have. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Lindsay. Um, so now we need a vote on position. On well, if, if, if it's your pleasure to take the report and adopt the positions that are set forth in the report, you could certainly do that. And then. May I interrupt for just a moment? Uh -oh. <laughs> Certainly. Yeah, we wouldn't dare stop you already. <laughs> <laughs> Wise man. Is your vehicle 85310? Yes. Could you please move it so I can get in my car? You can't crawl in the back window? I can't. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And thank you all. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Just to finish off, we have our legislative report. If it's your pleasure to adopt those particular positions, then that's how we will continue to advocate as the hearings come up. And as you meet again next month, we will report back to you again as to the results of all the hearings in the meantime and any additional information we learn. I make the motion that we adopt Okay. Motion made by Commissioner Morse. Anybody want to second it for us? Commissioner Stoll, um, to adopt the, <coughs> to adopt which position to support it? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, all, that, all those items were brought up last year, as far as I know. And uh, we just went over them again. I'd just like to move forward so they can be supported or monitored or whatever <coughs> suggested before. Okay. Now it, now it. Okay. So, all in favor of continuing on. <laughs> <laughs> right. well, continuing well, with um, with the stance that we position. have already previously taken on all of these bills signified by saying aye. Uh, aye. Anybody opposed? So moved. So that ends the, the legislative committee report, right? Yes, it does. Okay. 
Uh, Rivers Committee, which is Commissioner Ryan and Commissioner Hodgson, who, who just became aware of that fact that he saw on it. Um, I take it you didn't go to a Rivers Committee meeting. I have not yet. And your partner is on vacation somewhere, so I know he didn't have one. So we will say no, no meeting, no report. Um, Lakes Committee, Commissioner Cruz, he's not here. Um, Hamburg Orientation Committee, which is Patch, Patch, and Commissioner Carr. Well, we had no meeting, obviously, but we're still waiting for everything to settle down so we can make updates to the handbook. Okay. Um, strategic Planning Committee, which is Commissioner McGonagall and myself, which wasn't that sunsetted for now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so that's sunsetted, but it's showing up on here. So, um, Wildlife Heritage Foundation, Commissioner Hodgson, um, which we've got to find out when the meetings are so that you can attend. Um, I'll get that. Okay, and you can get that to him. Oh, that'd be good. Um, awards Committee, Commissioners Baldwin, McGonagall, Carr, and myself. I got a question. Have uh, we got any uh, application forms yet? Yes, in okay. fact, from what I was informed of the other day, the um, application period has, has ended. So all of the all of the applications are in, and we are going to have to have a meeting to go through them. So I I'm not sure time frame wise. Tanya is not here today. Um, if before the next commission meeting will be an early enough date, it's got to be before. Or the no, no. Doesn't that be before the next finish meeting, does it? Yeah. Would you give out the awards at the next one? No, no, no. No, we should have it before. So. <laughs> well, we're going to be here. We're going to be here. Well, yes, like before right. I mean, the, the morning. The day of. Oh, no, no, no. The day of. Yeah, 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 the yeah. day of. Or if that's soon enough, or if we have to schedule a meeting, special meeting, during, you know, halfway between. I wouldn't think so. Okay. Oh. So, if we can't get organized enough in one day, then we're in trouble. And finish off the next one. All right. Um, Just okay, a Jane. point of information. Historically, you all um, give out the commission awards at the April meeting. Um, so you're kind of working back from that. There are some notifications and so on that have to be done, inviting people to come. So that's why it probably is a good idea to start moving on it perhaps at the next meeting. Well, I mean, or. You, do you feel that before, if we do it at the February meeting that is early enough? Yeah, because you're, I mean, you're not going to give them out until the April meeting. So if you, if, as long as you kind of make your decisions so that people can be notified in March, you would still be on that schedule. Can we get copies of the application? Yeah, well, Tanya will put that yeah. stuff together. Yeah, because they all right? So we can yeah, see them ahead of time. So we can go over them before the meeting. That would be a good idea. We could, she we gave could us a book them. last year, which was phenomenal, like this year. Yeah, I think that was... That was really well done. Wasn't no. that um, Allison that put those together last year? Yeah, time you did, but she spent much too much time on them, and I, I, I think the gist of the meeting was that that really was unnecessary. But this was unnecessary? Yeah. It's not of your, not of your bill it out. And that's after the fact. We didn't have a, we didn't mark those individually and hand them in. Well, yeah, but we went through them. 
we we very no, I'm, through I'm ahead talking of about the evaluation, all the evaluation. Well, I mean, ideally, you should evaluate them. You should have, a, you know, they should be scored, and whoever's the highest scores should get the awards, right? I mean, I would think. I haven't been involved, but well, sort of, sort of, kind of. <laughs> well, I mean, if that's not the way you're doing it, then I would suggest you <laughs> consider a, a some sort of program like that. All right. Well, anyway, if we if we can get copies of the um, nominees ahead of time, then then we'd be a little more prepared for, yeah, for our meeting. Both well, Dr. Tanya. For okay. those who aren't familiar with the case, Tanya went off into the ditch on the way into work today in the snow. Oh. So. Okay. Old business. Right. Anybody oh have yeah. Old business. Yeah. Anybody have any new business? This has come up in the past. I'd just like to reiterate it and maybe I can get some guidance on how exactly how we can proceed. I've been contacted again from the people from Hunt of a Lifetime would be regarding uh, uh, the issuance of a permit for any big game hunt to terminate all kids uh, for we, have, we give out a bridge permit now, but it can be for a deer hunt, it can be for a bear hunt, it can be for any of the, the large game species, so it's not limited to moose. And the issue is New Hampshire is the only state out of all 50 that does not allow a non-resident uh, to be able to fill that tag if no one from the state is available. So I'd like to know, uh, one, where do, where, do, where do we stand with that? What? So, <coughs> When the bill, when that bill came into being, allowing it to happen, and it was put together by Bob Roof, who's the prime sponsor, I believe, and it was done that way by him on purpose. So, and in fact, I believe last year there was, uh, I think there was a bill filed to, to change it, and LaRue, who's vice chair, spoke emphatically against doing that. Right. Um, the, uh, you know, um, that's, it's his, it's his deal. You know, we have not, the department, whatever, hasn't moved to change that. Now, feeding upon that is, while we can certainly give anybody those other items that you mentioned, um, because of the nature of the, of the, the only uh, permit that is, hard to get, shall we say, because the others are all walk-ins, is moose, the only ones anyone's ever asked for is a moose permit. And that is being complicated, of course, now by the fact that, you know, we're only giving we out a really ones. limited, you know, uh, situation. So, um, and, and in fact, uh, you know, even though it's, it's hurting them a bit, we're limiting it to one to the foundation also. So, uh, the uh, so I mean I guess that's you know something about you know policy discussion about you know how you guys want to proceed I mean you know it will take legislation right. and you know Bob being Bob I don't know if you're going to change his mind his you know he designed that thing and that was his gig so yeah, um, so uh, but there it sits it was it was it was ITL last go around to change it, and uh, um, you know I understand the situation in, in you know other states, um, but you know there you have it. We we never the the department and the commission is really never. We're powerless. Asked. We're powerless to basically do anything about it. I understand. Well, we could you know you guys can go over the legislature. And, you know, or have a conversation with Bob, see if he's willing to put a bill in, which would at this point be next year, right? To modify that, uh, or somebody else over there. And um, you know, I don't know that you know anyone here has got big angst about it. It's just the that's just the way it came down, and, and it's not in rule; it's in law. So there's nothing we can do about right. it. I can see it out there. You know, we can save the moose permit for a resident and somebody else can get a deer or a bear hunt. So maybe that might be a way to, to try to approach it anyway. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, like I say, you know, I've had situations where people have come in and uh, they just, there's just no interest because you can do it anywhere right. of a deer or bear. So. Right, but a terminal mm -hmm. kid <laughs> really probably doesn't have that option. Yeah. You know, so as if you can get his brother going to haul him out to a tree stand and say, sit here for four days. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, he is, the, the person from Honorable Lifetime is scheduled to be on the agenda for the next meeting yeah. to give a brief presentation. And we could extend an invite to LaRue to be here, for that, right. which is probably, if you want to go down that road, and, and you know, that's you guys, if you get, I would, I would say if you want to go down that road, you know, feel free to go down it, but I mean, I think that's a discussion amongst yourselves, whether you do or don't. Okay. Um, you know, whether all the other states do it or not, that should yeah. bear on your... <laughs> Because I'll guarantee you, they ain't coming here for anything else. So, <laughs> yeah, Bucky, you you were you were part of that. Yeah. Of yeah, from the beginning, when we were allowed to, you know, and, and you know, there'll always be a state kid who's gonna, you know, uh, gonna get the the tag. Even even if there's another a kid out of state, there's always a child in need over here. Uh, Keith Roberge, who's been doing all the hunts. The last few years, he's had no trouble getting a recipient. So, uh, perfectly honest with you, it's like hitting your head against the wall. We'll always have a child from our state. And we've, we didn't have a problem when there were two tags, and certainly not a problem that we have one. But as far as the taking of other animals, even if the kid was out of state, the guides are always out there and willing to do something. My, myself, uh, we had a hunt of a lifetime child come in and prior to the moose season, well, he took a bear with us. So, I mean, it, it, it's not like these guys out of state or in state, if they're physically unable uh, to participate, we, we get a, the guys go out of their way for these guys, you know? Yeah, yeah. And as, especially Keith Roberge, who does an excellent job at what he does, yeah, you know, I so. Know, know yeah, so. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> um, any other new Okay, on the commissioner's reports. Um, one of the things I had, I had a call from an irate sporting goods store in Hillsboro. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not to let anybody know where it was from. About. Um, the word, if you go in the law book, the wording on youth muzzleloader is really kind of unclear. Youth muzzleloader? Yeah, because you have to have, apparently you have to have a youth muzzleloader tag, but you don't need a hunting license. But you still need the tag. And there was, there was oh, like you're a, talking about a kid under 16 going muzzleloader hunting? Yes. Okay. And if he's a non-resident, it, it looked the same for non-resident and, and resident. I guess there was an issue with a non-resident and a kid got arrested for not having a muzzleloader tag and kind of caused a stir. But <coughs> reading the book, it, it's... I think it could be worded a little bit clearer. <coughs> Maybe if someone could just take a look at the wording and see if it can be something can be done to eliminate this mistake. Yeah, I, Dave, you're hiding in the back there. <laughs> um, it, so, if if a kid's under 16, he needs a he needs a muzzleloader permit to. Deer hunt with a muzzleloader, right? Correct. Okay. In state or out of state, doesn't matter. Right. And a lot of it was an issue with Vermont because that they require us to do that, which is why that exists. Um, it's listed under the age columns, which is how we teach that in hunter safety. When you teach a new group of hunters what they have to buy and what they don't have to buy, we go under that age column. 
and it clearly says on both non-resident and resident all ages. That's that's how they they, they look at it. Has it always been that way? Ever since I've been around. Yeah, it's, it's the same with turkeys, right? The kid needs a turkey tag. Correct. Same with bear. Yeah. Well, uh, excuse me, muzzleloader is the only one where it's different between a resident and non-resident. How's that? Um, a resident under 16 does not have to buy the muzzle or license. Just a, just a non-resident? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In, in the individual that uh, Commissioner Phillips was talking about did not uh, end up uh, going home with this ticket. That was taken care of because it was a misunderstanding. They were first time in the state. Yeah. So. Do you think there's any any way of making that a little bit clearer in the books in the future? Oh, <coughs> uh, we can certainly take a peek at it. Um, I don't have a book in front of me, but you know, for 20 years when you teach a new group of people what they have to buy and what they don't have to buy, because it's different on residents and non-residents, that age column is, is is what we go by. But again, if I had a dollar for everyone who read that book, I'd be poor. <laughs> it's so true. Yeah. Well, I mean, even even we have even had a sheriff, ex sheriff that read them over, and so he was confused by it too. So I don't feel quite so bad. So here, non-resident muzzle loader license, all of these. Okay. I see why, because they didn't get the the the, uh, the the muzzle loader license comes up early, and it says muzzle loader license later on down the list is a non-resident <coughs> muzzle loader one, which didn't read it all, which they didn't go. Mm -hmm. Far enough, shall we say, to get to But it, yeah, if you think it would help make a special note, I can bring that up for the next. Uh, when they, we adopt those, we have a go around the whole agency, so we can do that. Sure. Okay. Yeah, because on the side it says New Hampshire residents, but right. it's all a blur. <laughs> all right. Thank you. <clears throat> um, any of the commissioners have? Anything special to report? Kind of debating over it. Debating on me, aren't you? Kind of. Um, okay. Well, we'll, just, we'll just leave it. I'll make a special trip. You'll make, well, I was going to go the other way with that. <laughs> I heard that. Um, <laughs> Commissioner McGonagall, who's been on the commission now for what eight eight, and a half. eight years eight and a half years um his term is up and we're not sure if he's going if this is his last meeting or not but we're thinking it probably is um so i would like to take a moment to thank commissioner mcgonagall for his service he's, he's been on all kinds of committees he helped us a lot at Barry Camp, including getting over 10 grand worth of material given to us to complete our project up there. Um, you know, worked on worked on uh, the awards committees. He's, he's been on policy. He's you know basically done anything anybody has asked him to do and was a major asset to this commission. I want to, th I want to thank you for so the, new, yes. the new Tahoe that you gave me. It's really cool. <laughs> 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 I love the inside. It really came so, out good. So I'd like to ask everyone to just give him oh, yeah. a
commissioners have something to report? Our new commissioners, do you get your handbooks and packets and whatnot? Okay. Next um, meeting. Yeah, get into the law book by the next meeting. Next meeting. The yeah. next meeting date is. Next meeting date is a good question. Yeah, February 14th. February 14th. What do you refer to? February 14th. Okay. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm time Back to, to the second Wednesday. Okay, I got to call the way time by that. She told me the 21st. Well, yeah. Yours is me. Second like Wednesday, Wednesday the 14th. Maybe it well, they changed it though. Did they change both of them? January and February? I know. No. Yeah, they started at 6 21st. Yeah. 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 Uh, we changed January and April. Oh, April. You guys April. changed it, yeah. but I changed April. the next meeting because I needed to be somewhere else, I think. So. I think you changed March, didn't you? I, fr I don't know what meeting. March would have made the sense. That would have been I the think you change. changed March. Well, we always need time to hear. It's the second Wednesday. When is the March meeting? Yeah, meeting? February 14th, right? March, I changed March, I think, because of a meeting I had to go to. So. Well, I think March is the second Wednesday. Yeah. All right. Okay, so on to director's report. Okay, so uh, um, for a start, you guys need to have your um, things filled out and left here on the way out the door, um, and that will be a problem for those that aren't here because they're going to miss their date. But anyway, um, those financial uh, reports have to be filed Friday, so. I need to uh, be able to put those in. Paul, Paul, I put mine on time and test. Oh, thank you. All right. Um, you, see that? you don't have to get too carried away with them, but I can tell you that at times they get right to no requested, so you want to make sure it's on file. Uh, as far as uh, um, what else is happening? Um, you know, it's it's been a little hectic lately because obviously the legislature's in session and the bills are coming strong. And we had a weather day where they didn't do a session last last week that shoved everything into this week, and uh, so we've been running back and forth over there. Um, you know, things are really still picking, just picking steam up after the holidays. You know, we'll be going through the usual every two-year thing with wildlife, so there'll be hearings in Lancaster, Keene, and here when we finally get to the final uh, proposals on the uh, game rules as, as per usual. Um, wildlife gave you the, the whole schedule for the, so that you can plan ahead. And, uh, Probably the only other thing I'll mention uh, that I can think of uh, is uh, this morning when I wasn't here, for, uh, I was over at the legislature for a hearing on a centipede bill. Um, the, uh, Representative uh, Hansen uh, from Amherst, who's, try, who's got a bill in to try to boost our centipede program. I don't know really how far that will go. Um, I've also been, uh, was stuck on the Sunapee Commission <laughs> that is supposedly looking at, you know, alternatives and whatnot. I don't really know what's going to come out of that, but I, I'm not holding my breath. Uh, and that has sort of been in a logger head at, is the, at the last meeting that I was at, as one could expect. Uh, so I'm not seeing a whole lot of light at the end of that tunnel at the moment. Um, I, I, I came back over here after I testified, um, and given the, my sort of situation, what I mostly did was just go answer questions, because that bill is sitting at uh, Public Works, not at Fish and Game. A bunch of people that really don't know a whole lot of the history of it, so I basically uh, answered all the questions they had 
about how we were going to pay the bond off and all that stuff. And, and then I left it to Don Clark and the crew to carry the flag and came back over here. I really couldn't take another hour of rehashing that for the hundred thousandth time. So, um, and what else? I think that uh, I think that that's really it. I we everything's been kind of closed down for the holidays and is just now really ramping back up into sh into shape. So hopefully. Uh, but getting out and getting old vice fishing in. <laughs> so, um, we, it, I guess one thing that does bear some discussion is we, we have been uh, working on some land projects. We did, what did we close on, Mark? The uh, piece down in uh, Richmond? Yeah, well, we had the 600 and something acres at. Uh, Stonehouse Pond. Well, Stonehouse Pond was 1,500 acres that we, you know, contributed to, and we're looking at several other, uh, several other properties right now. Um, the one you'd be familiar with would be the Red, Red Hill era. Uh, unfortunately, it's uh, currently being cut to within an inch of its life, so I'm not sure that what the value <laughs> will be when when that comes along, but uh, that, you know, sums it up for now. Everything's just puttering along. And, uh, you know, if anyone's got any questions about anything, I'm happy to answer. Questions to the director? Where are you going? Well, well, call the Republic. <laughs> call the Republic. Okay, what is he? Um, I have a few protocol questions and then I have a comment. So my question is, when you're petitioned by the public to consider opening rulemaking, what is the commission's responsibility to read comments about that issue? What is the responsibility to Sorry. read and consider comments? So when a petition is filed, what's the commission's responsibility to read those comments? From the public. Uh, what we have done is we've compiled those comments for them. They were universally supportive of the petition and the, its request. And we reported that to the commission uh, during their earlier deliberation. So the department's required to read it, but not the commission. Right. We compiled them for them, and uh, there were no comments that were not supportive of the petition that had been filed, and that was reported to them. And how many comments did the department receive? I believe it was 124. So my comment is that the, it sounds like the basis of the reason to not even open public hearings or comments on that issue is because there's no research or data to support what's been asked. And my concern is that in our four-page comments, we had no less than 16 research references to coyote bio biology, and that's just our comments. So if the argument is that there shouldn't be comments because there's no research, and yet the commission hasn't reviewed the research, I have concerns about that process. I recognize that we will agree to disagree on what's best for coyotes and predators, but when you haven't even considered what those comments say and you don't open up an opportunity for the public to speak at hearing, that message is not appropriate from my perspective. So to not even hear the public's comments and then make your decision. You're voting on the game management rules in a couple of months. You can make your decision then. But I think squashing this today uh, was really disappointing for a lot of, of members of the public. Anybody else? Uh, the oh. New Hampshire Trappers Association appreciates that the New Hampshire Fish and Game Department biologists look at research and consider peer-reviewed white pages legitimate studies when they consider their management, and we appreciate that. My name is Christina. Uh, I just have a quick question about the uh, proposals that were on there that weren't taken on. So not the coyotes, but things like an additional hunting for the squirrel, um, things like that. Those uh, will be having public comment, is that correct, at those three places that you mentioned? Okay, so we can um, have public Yeah, there's a process where 
over the next commission meeting, uh, it'll be officially, you know, it, those could change, but there'll be whatever is going to go out is going to be officially adopted as the proposal that goes to the public and for comment, and then there'll be the public hearings. And then at that point, the public can put their input into what they feel about those proposals. Yeah, either in writing or in person. You know, those hearings are typically, <coughs> especially at Keene and Lancaster, pretty well attended. Okay, that's awesome. Yeah, you're talking about petitions. There was nothing in the agenda saying that's going to happen, so how does it get out to the sporting public? Uh, these people must have put their own websites and whatever they did on it and get this notice out that they're all show up here. But how about the sportsmen? I, I haven't seen a thing or heard a thing about this until I come here today. Yeah, but. Bill, it's at the it's at the it's at the initial proposal stage. It's not it's not. Well, she's complaining that they didn't get their, their, their say. But how about the sportsmen getting their say? The guys that paid the bill. Yeah. No, I hear what you're saying. I'm just yeah, saying. Yeah, it's, it's kind of nice to look at the amendment. I mean, the agenda and see what's happening here today. Yeah. I just happened to show up. <laughs> A lot of sportsmen did hear about the what petition, do you mean? Bill. Pardon? A lot of people did hear about the petition because we did get a lot of comments on Facebook from sportsmen. Very um, nasty comments. I don't go to Facebook. I'm well, sick of what from people. And, um, yeah. you know, as far as Lindsay's comments, I have them here if you'd like to read them. I wasn't aware that you don't even read these comments. How can you make a decision without even reading this? Anyway, I have it here now if you'd like to read it. It's not too late. But... It's too late now. Too late now. Like uh, Bucky said, this is like hitting your head against the wall. Hey, Patricia from Warner, New Hampshire. I was a battle lab aide for most of the people who remember it, Theo and Helen Silva back in the late 60s. I knew you when you were just starting out. We all worked work together. Um, and I worked on a project where they brought the first koi dogs in Croydon that were found in a den. And they were. An anomaly then. And now what we've got, got right now, if we don't control them, we're going to look at another 15 years and see what we've got. But they crossed the, they, they did breeding experiments with them. They used setter, they brought in a Tim Wolf, um, German Shepherds, and they made it with anything you put in there in canine. And they are this. He can attest to, I can attest If she wants to get on a 20 mile hike on a snowshoe, I can show you 10 dead deer right now. There's no such thing as a koi dog. What's that? There's no such thing as a koi dog. They, they were called koi dog. They might have been called koi Originally, before they dis discovered that they were separate species, everybody knew what they were. That's what everybody called them. That's what everybody called them back 30 years ago. Well, that's what they were called 30 years ago. They were, they were, they were an anomaly. They were found and it was like, what are these things? I worked on the project that researched them. Yeah. There's no such thing as a quid. But if you want to take a you know, 20 mile hike tomorrow with me, I can show you 10 dead deer and, you know. Okay, you know, we can call There might be a conversation we want to have after. You can take it outside. <laughs> <laughs> um, two things. So, one, is it is it the positions that were taken are exactly what is in the printout? on all the legislation, so there's no additional legislation uh, that was that positions were taken on today? That's correct. So that's, that publication is accurate as it was a month ago? Yes. Okay. Uh, and secondly, just in the hunt of a lifetime, one of the things that we, uh, we had an issue with with that program was that we actually uh, had a disagreement with the, uh, I don't know if national or regional coordinator, and what she was actually uh, demanding, not asking, not wishing, demanding, was the ability to make a, make, uh, th they make the decision between it's New Hampshire or it's an out-of-state person. So I'd be hesitant, at least warn the commission, that that is actually their intent, is that they make the decision, not New Hampshire, so. Um, can't 
Um, I'm just curious if Lindsay can tell me whether the studies that she referenced were done here in the state of New Hampshire or New England? Um, so the list is both from the Northeast and also from uh, the West Coast. And certainly the, the studies that we've looked at and the studies that other experts have looked at are, they range across across the coyote population and the different species. So across the United States right. then. Okay, is it possible for you to provide me with any studies that were done here in New England? I'm happy to I've look. done a lot of Googling and I can find nothing, any studies whatsoever being done here in New England and the most recent one I could find was done in 2009, but it was not in New England. Yep, I'm happy to look. Okay, thank you. Um, and I will make one other point and be very short on this, but I appreciate that the Trappers Association is uh, supportive of fish and game biologists. I think fish and game biologists have proposed that the season be closed. So we can't have it both ways. We can't trust that the biologists have reviewed all of the information and proposed something that the commission then rejected and to be happy that the biologists have reviewed it. So I just want to point that out. <clears throat> I'd like a quick comment. Um, in regards to the Humane Society of the United States of America and the Voices of the Wildlife, these people are dedicated to put us out of the woods. They want to do away with all trapping. Uh, they'd rather manage wildlife through emotionalism than they would with science and education. My comment. <laughs> Anybody else? Anybody want to make a motion to adjourn? So moved. Commissioner Moore, seconded by Commissioner Armstrong. All in favor? All right. Let's get out of here. I am.